On the day that Jesus rose from the dead, Resurrection Sunday, the Bible records there are five different appearances that he made to different people. The first was to Mary Magdalene when she mistook him for the gardener. The second one was to a group of women on the road as they headed back towards um, Jerusalem to tell the disciples. At some stage he met with Simon Peter, though interestingly enough we don't have any record of that but twice it says he's met with Peter. And then, the, then he met with the two disciples on the road to Emmaus. One of them is called Clopas, the other one might have been his wife, we don't know who they were. And then final one is that he met with, he came into the closed room where the disciples were huddled in fear for persecution of the Jews. And that's the story we're going to talk about tonight. But it's interesting, five times, isn't it? Five times he talks to the, he appears to people after his resurrection on the first day. And I guess that tells us that Jesus wanted to create a missional group of people who would uh, believe him and follow uh, him and uh, continue his mission. And they could be men or women, they could be sinners, failures, fearful, pilgrims. All kinds of people have a part to play in the mission of Jesus. So in this story in John 20, it says, On the first day of the week, they were gathered. Interestingly enough, some people have seen a lot of significance in this first day of the week. The evening of the first day of the week, you know, in Jewish calendars the day begins at evening this is the beginning of a new creation this is the beginning of a whole new era this is the eighth day there are seven days of creation the seventh was the sabbath but this is the eighth day the beginning of the next season now that jesus has risen from the dead everything is different and the disciples had gathered together um, and locked themselves in and locked the doors because they were afraid of the jewish leaders and Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And when he said, said this, he showed them his hands and his side. That's what the scripture says. So they're still in the dark. Their conception is that they are the last of a remnant of followers of this Messiah. The Jews and the Romans together have killed the leader. And now they're trying to mop up the last remnants of this failed messianic movement. But that wasn't the perception of Jesus. He saw it as the first day of the week, the first day of a new creation. These weren't the end of a movement. These were the beginning, the pioneers, the forerunners, the, the first fruits, the starters, the startup <laughs> entrepreneurs who were gonna start a new movement that was going to take the world by storm. And so there they are on the first day of the week. And they're huddled in there, afraid. And Jesus appears through the locked doors. It's interesting to hear how he appears through locked doors. It's some kind of miracle, I suppose. He tells us in the Sermon on the Mount that when we pray, we should go inside a room and lock the door. It's pretty clear that doesn't keep Jesus out. Where two or three are gathered together, there am I in the midst. Go in there and lock the door and pray. And Jesus will be there present in your midst. And so Jesus comes into the presence of these fearful disciples and he says, peace be with you. Now, man, they needed that peace. Some of them were feeling terrible because of the failures they'd experienced just that night before. Others were feeling afraid because of the external pressures of the Jewish leaders and the Pharisees. The text says then, he showed them his hands and his feet. Now, we didn't do this because they asked. They didn't say, hey, show us the wounds. And the wounds would have been fresh, only a couple of days old. They didn't, but he knows this will be very important because they're gonna to have to testify, that, answer a lot of questions in, year, in years to come. People will say, did you see him? Are you sure it was really him? What did he look like? How do you know it was him? How do you know it wasn't just a ghost? How do you know it wasn't just a vision? Or if they believed them, they might have said, so what's the resurrection body like? Is it perfect? And they could answer all these questions because they had seen him 
and he'd shown them his hands and his feet. But there was something more wonderful than that. It says that when they, he showed them his hands and his feet, they rejoiced. Because see, crucifixion was the ultimate torture and humiliation of people who tried to rebel against the powers of Rome. It snuffed out all pride. It snuffed out all resistance, all spirit, all hope. It was the mangling of a body in utter disgusting ignominy and abasement. And Jesus is showing them that no one can be so despised and rejected that God can't lift them up. No one can be so humiliated and degraded, but they don't have a future. And, in his, and Jesus is showing that but the fact that he's been through the worst with his hands and his feet still bearing the scars and he's come through. There's a new series on the TV called The Chosen. It's, a, it's not on television, it's a, one you can download. It's a, it's a retelling of the story of Jesus. It's a very interesting series. And it, it chooses to begin with the story of a woman who is completely out of her mind. She's degraded, debased, she's demonic, she's out of control, she screams and, and uh, she's filthy. And the people around her try to get her cured. And they call in the leading Pharisee of the area. His name is Nicodemus. And Nicodemus comes and he meets this woman and she nearly tears his eyes out. And her name's Mary and she's from Magdalene. Magdala, she's Mary the Magdalene. And he tries everything, this Nicodemus, the Pharisee. He's a member of the Sanhedrin. He's a leading elder of the Jews. He tries everything in their book of tricks to try and get her healed. He's saying prayers and incantations. He's ritually doing ceremonies and things to try and purify her. And nothing works. And he gives up. But after he's gone, a man turns up, a wanderer, a traveler that nobody knows, because at this stage he hasn't gone public. And uh, he, um, he comes to her and he holds her and he reassures her and then he sets her free. And she becomes, in the rest of the story, Mary Magdalene becomes a leading disciple. She's mature, she's kind, she's clean, she's trustworthy, she's gentle, she's a wonderful character and she is devoted to Jesus because Jesus has rescued her from the degradation and suffering and pain that she's been in. And that's what Jesus is like. He comes to us in our worst times and he lifts us up. He's able to make hope and a future for those who are, have been through the worst and that's why he showed them his hands and his feet. You can go through the crucifixion and there'll be a resurrection to follow. All of Jesus' life is about this. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. And you're blessed are the hungry and the thirsty. Blessed, are the, you know, she loves much because she's forgiven much, he says about another lady. Um, I came not to call the righteous, but the sinners to repentance, he says. I mean, yeah. And um, even if you crush me on a rugged cross, I will rise from the dead. That's the message of Jesus' life. And so when the disciples see this, they rejoice. For death can't hold him down. He's scarred but victorious. The Lion of Judah has conquered by becoming the slain lamb, as Revelation chapter 5 puts it. Who wouldn't rejoice? There is hope for the failures. There's forgiveness for sinners. There's restoration for the broken. There's a future for the hopeless. There's a reversal of the old order. Is newness from numbness. But Jesus hasn't come just to show them that he can do it. He's come with a purpose. He's come to commission them. He comes and he says to them, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so send I you. And so Jesus has come to give them a commissioning. Now at the end of every one of the Gospels, there's two things that Jesus does. He sends the disciples out on a great commission and he he fills them with the Holy Spirit so they can do it, or he promises his presence in some way. And so here in John, as the Father sent me, so send I you, is his great commission. Well, how did the Father send Jesus? Well, first of all, he sent him like a, like a lamb among wolves. He, was, he sent Jesus to earth unarmed, unprotected, vulnerable, 
The only weapons he gave him were the weapons that we have. Love, prayer, compassion and wisdom. And he didn't just send him to sort of stand on the bank and shout at someone who's getting drowning. He sent him right into the water. He sent him all the way to incarnation and identification. As John 1, 14 says, The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Or as the message says, It moved into our neighborhood, tabernacled amongst us. He became flesh and became one of us. He left his glory and entered fully into the human experience. Fully human. Baby, child, teen, worker, living under oppression. Fully human. And it wasn't an easy life. He walked the road of suffering. Of course, he walked in the end into crucifixion, the worst of all suffering. But he walked the road of suffering, didn't shy away from that. There was no protection or guarantee that he would be without pain in his journey. But he was always in connection with God, always in communion with God. It was like um, the mobile phone was never out of range. He had continual fellowship with God. And he said, the words that I say to you are the words I've been given to say. I do the things my father asked me to do. And he always was the representative of God. He says, the one who sent me was the one he was representing. There's an old Jewish saying that says, one who is sent is as the one who sends him. And I guess that means like, you know, like you know, supposing you send someone to collect a debt, you know, well, you might know anything to the man who comes, but you owe it to the man who sent him. And so the one who is sent represents the one who sent him. And so Jesus represented the Father in authority and in character. Character, He was like the Father. They were similar. An ambassador has all the authority of the nation and the president behind him. And so it is with Jesus. He was the one who was sent. And then he was empowered by the Spirit from woe to go. The Holy Spirit filled him and gave him insight and answers and words to say and deeds to do. Helped him resist the temptations of the devil by careful use of scripture. And above all, Jesus was clear of purpose. Um, he was sent with a message and a kingdom to proclaim and a, a, a job to do. He restored lost people to participate in this kingdom that he was proclaiming. He gathered a new restored Israel, starting with 12. He announced the end of the temple, the sacrifices, and the power arrangements of the old Israel calling them to repentance and renewal in order to avoid destruction. That's how Jesus was sent, and that's how he sends us. It sends, says in John 13, verse 20, when Jesus is talking to the disciples, he says, I tell you the truth. Anyone who welcomes my messenger is welcoming me, and anyone who welcomes me is welcoming the Father who sent me. So we're sent out as messengers of Jesus, and he's a messenger of the Father. And so together, we're uh, in a powerful continuation, a stream. I've got a song about that in just a moment. But how, did, uh, how was Jesus sent? And it's a bit like us, isn't it? So I thought about... <clears throat> so here's some books. So, Jesus came, preaching peace. He, um, he talked about building community and growth. And we will do the same. This is what we ought to do. We're to preach peace and build community and growth. Now, he faced spiritual conflicts, and so were we. But remember, he moved right in with the people. He hung around with the community. He didn't separate himself from sinners. He was the God next door. And we're to be right there with people, live our lives with them. But he was never out of communion with God. And we um, can enjoy the same thing. We can learn to have communion with God. Now, the people we hang around with, will probably be like this. This is a book about Baptists, would you believe? A turbulent, seditious, and factious people. It's about the people in the 17th century from whom John Bunyan lived amongst. And, and we're to um, become part of the new community through baptism, and we're to live the messianic lifestyle, life on the road. And when we do, we may well find that it's beyond imagining. This is what, so then Jesus breathes the Holy Spirit on them. Now today is the day of Pentecost. We celebrate this 50 days after the um, resurrection of Jesus. And, and here in John's Gospel, 
his chronology is different to Luke's, but the message is the same, that there's no sending out on mission without empowering. And so the Holy Spirit is breathed into these uh, disciples. They are commissioned and sent and empowered. And what this tells me, it tells me is that uh, there's no sending without spirit. God does not ask us to do something without supplying what we need for the task. Now, sometimes we have to dig very deep. We didn't think we could do it, but God has given us what we need in order to fulfill the task that he's given us. You know, if God calls you to come, and walk, come across to him on the water, he'll allow you to walk on the water. If God sends us to serve him in some place, we'll be given what we need to do the job. And here he breathes on them and gives them the Holy Spirit. This is an echo of Genesis 2 where God creates humans out of mud and clay and flesh and he breathes into their nostrils the breath of life. Here he's creating a community out of these broken, failed disciples and he breathes into them the spirit of life. So Jesus breathing the Holy Spirit into his disciples. It's like that first time in the garden. It's also like the one in Ezekiel 37 where... The nation is dead and it's in exile and it's lost and it, it, it comes back in like a skeleton but there's no life and the Holy Spirit comes and blows into the nostrils of the skeletons and they become alive. And that's what the Holy Spirit's supposed to do. It's supposed to make you come alive. It reminds me of the fantastic song called Come Alive in P.T. Barnum's The Greatest Showman uh, story. Uh, with, starring Hugh Jackman, it's the most fantastic, you know, exciting musical. And what he does, P.T. Barnum goes around finding broken misfits who are hiding out and where people can't laugh at them, and he gets them into his circus and he makes them stars. That's the great American dream, I know. It's and it's just pure humanism. You know, to dream of a better world and you can make it happen if you just dream. You know, we know that's a fantasy that leaves many people feeling disappointed and left out. But it's a great and powerful image of what Jesus was on about. He's, he comes into a room full of broken, fearful men, and he says to them, Come alive! Come alive! Don't hang your head. Don't hide in the dark. Follow me. Go where I've sent you. Shine your light. Wake up. Get moving in the power of the Holy Spirit. I'm going to play that clip in just a moment, but it's not uh, always dramatic or exciting, but at Pentecost we can dream with our eyes wide open. The world can become a better place. We can live with purpose and power. We can go where we are sent. We can speak a word or offer kindness or be a presence or make a difference. So, you know, open your heart to the Holy Spirit. Let him fill you. We do this with a prayer. We say, come Holy Spirit. I offer you all I am. I ask you to light the light in me to dispel my apathy and disappointment and fill me with the spirit of Jesus so that I can be Jesus all the places I go and all the things that I do. And that's what the meaning of the day of Pentecost is. Come alive!